Next up, I am beyond excited to introduce a partner and a friend of a partner with us, Desiree Gruber. We've had the pleasure of working with Desiree and her amazing team on our Homebridge partnership with Serena Williams and on our recent fundraise. And I've been awed and inspired watching Desiree in action. She's a Peabody Award winner who founded Full Picture, a brand accelerator, content production, communications and consulting service, company now in its 21st year with a passion to help clients more effectively tell their stories and launch new ideas into the world. We've seen this impact in brilliance firsthand at Apartment West. Desiree is also co-founder of Dragon, uh, Diagonal Ventures, uh, which architects transformational deals across the consumer, technology, and media spectrum. She's a board member of Hydrofacial and UNICEF USA, an advisor to leading organizations such as Anthos Capital, Pharrell Williams, Something in the Water, and Chegg. In short, she's awesome. Uh, Desiree is a proud wife, mother, investor, and entrepreneur, and we're lucky to have Desiree with us today, alongside an incredible panel that Desiree will introduce, including a very good friend of mine, Mike Megpio, who, fun fact, introduced my wife and I, um, and is doing big things in college sports. Desiree, welcome to Spark. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Wow, that was a fantastic intro. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was amazing. Wow. Um, I'm speechless after that. I, I, I guess I'm really busy doing a lot of things. So thank you guys for having me here. I'm so inspired by Apartment List and the team there. Every time I have an interaction, it's like, these people are just delivering their A game in everything they do. And it's such a pleasure to be in your ecosystem, in your universe, and know that when I introduce you to somebody, for example, we made the Serena Williams partnership, that you guys are going to bring an A game and take it to the next level and just unexpected outcomes because of your ability to dig deep and bring your best to the table every time there's an interaction. So thank you to Apartment Lifts. John Cobbs, there are no words, you're amazing. Lauren Baum, what an incredible partner. We are um, inspired by you. I have goosebumps. We're inspired by your work ethic and the way you guys think about the world and changing the game and getting people into housing that they love and homes that are homes. So I'm super proud to be here today. Also, I love interviewing people who are high achievers, who are changing the game, and who think about the world in a different way. And that's what we have here today. We have three outstanding executives and people in their fields who really are game changers, who break boundaries and barriers, and think about the world a little bit differently. So hopefully I will be your guide and moderator today into their worlds. and. Um, pull out a few nuggets of wisdom from them that will inspire us and help us think about our careers a little bit differently. I'm always shocked when I talk to great leaders and I'm like, well, you know, what's the secret to your success? How do you do this? And they're like, I don't know. I didn't think about it. I just got out and I did it. So hopefully today we're going to get some real nuggets in here. Um, I am going to read the intros because I find that I get over energetic and sometimes I'll leave out a big detail. I am super lucky that I do know two of our three panelists today personally. So I will kick it off with Anjula, who I know for many years in New York City, and I have to say um, is an amazing human and individual. And Anjula, it is so fun. Every time I see you at some major event, she's so low key and like, oh, hey, what's up? And then Priyanka Chopra gets on stage and is like, and to my best friend, Anjula, who's here, who's a game changer for me in my world. And I'm like, she's so low key. And then Priyanka Chopra is on stage, UNICEF accepting an award and shouting you out and name checking you. So <laughs> you're an amazing person. I'm, I'm blessed to get to know you, but let me give the exact bio so you guys know exactly where we're going here. So Anjula Anchari, uh, CEO, A-Series Investments and Management. This is my own. One of the most brilliant entrepreneurial minds I know. She's a strategist and strategic investor and advisor to a multitude of consumer tech and CPG startups, including two early stage investments, which have grown into billion dollar unicorns. You may ask which ones. ClassPass and Bumble, two of my favorites. She introduced artists like Lady Gaga, 
Britney Spears in 50 Cent to India. And in return, she brought Priyanka Chopra to America and unleashed her on us. What an amazing gift to bring her over. Um, you are still involved in Priyanka's career to today and game-changing investments and helping her think about leading the charge as a woman on the stage thinking about how does she put her equity behind brands and how does she help shine a light on other businesses and it's it's such a, a thrill to see what you do and it's amazing to have you involved in apartment list as well and i'm so excited to have you here today and get to grill you a little bit see what we can <laughs> thank find you out. so much desiree you're so gracious yeah. okay great evelyn rusley evelyn is a newer friend evelyn is somebody who comes out of one world which is media and journalism and has made the jump into a new world which is that of being a founder of a new company let me read this exactly so that we don't miss anything basically she's a complete badass who's breaking barriers all the time and going after her dreams and changing the game and letting other women watch her journey which is such a pleasure that i get to be involved and see you do that on a daily basis um, but what if, and if you are um, a parent and you have a young child, you've absolutely unequivocally heard of You Me because it's all anybody's talking about right now is that they are changing the game in, I want to say it exactly right, it's a health sciences company that is breaking the mold on baby food and nutrition for kids. So it's been such a hard journey for so many parents thinking about how do we feed our kids in the highest quality ingredients and make it really yummy as well. And it's not been done. And so Yumi is doing that and breaking the barrier and actually changing the way we think about what is possible because the government has not regulated this industry in a way that is up to the standards of many of us as parents. And so they've stepped in to lead the charge there and shine a light on the industry and help us think about it in a different way. Um, Previous to this, Evelyn was a renowned New York Times tech journalist and then took the leap into this. And so I'm excited to hear how you broke that barrier and what were you thinking about as you did it and um, just presenting yourself in a different way. So uh, thank you, Evelyn. Thanks for being here. Thank you. You give the best intros. <laughs> well, I'm truly interested. So I can't, you guys have no idea. I love this. Mike, Mike Magpayo, Payo, Payo, Magpayo. Want to get it right? Uh, Mike, Magpie. we met this week. Magpayo. Nailed it. Yep. Yes. Okay. Woohoo. Um, <laughs> I, I could get a job at Sports Center. You might recognize Mike from Sports Center clips. So, Mike is uh, breaking the barriers in his industry. And it says here he's the only Division I men's basketball coach of Asian descent in the NCAA. I mean, the only, I mean, that's like one of one. That's incredible. Bravo, congrats on all that you do to change the game and be up there. We had a quick call earlier in the week and we said like, you know, how do you do it? And you're thinking about this and this is your career, you're coaching others and, and how do you get up there? And is the only coach of Asian, and he's like, I don't even think about it. Like, it's not like he doesn't wake up every day and say, okay, I'm the only one, how am I gonna do this today? So we definitely wanna hear your secrets and how you do that. And I think that the audience here you know, in their own businesses across the country is they're waking up every day looking for inspiration and thinking about how could I change the game in my business? How can I stand out? And I think right now also coming out of the uncertainty with the pandemic and is thinking about how we bring our communities back together. And in business, a lot of you out there are being charged with being leaders and coming in and being the one who's inspiring others and being the face of the company. And so that's why this panel is so important to think about diverse communities and how we bringing people together and putting them in um, communities that are connected and allow them to take to the next level. And it's a moment right now we could actually change the face of the way things are done because it's a fresh start. A lot of people are looking to see, let's do things differently. And so these three leaders are here today to share their wisdom. Um, I was going to kick off with Anjula and, you know, you, you're a star in so many disparate industries. Is there anything when you think about, you know, today I'm going to do this, that you, do you feel like you're <clears throat> in one industry or do you feel like, okay, today I'm waking up and I'm changing the game for multiple people, in lots of industries, or how do you think about your career? Because it's so multifaceted. 
You know, I think there's been a consistent theme through my career, which is, and only sort of really realized it recently, um, is, is really, I just want to help women achieve their goals and their dreams. And um, whether they're women entrepreneurs or whether they're women celebrities, women in entertainment, as long as they're doing something in, in, in entertainment that's meaningful to me, like I don't want to make any stupid people famous. I have no desire to do that. I want to make people famous who can really change the game, whether it's in inclusion and diversity or whether it's in um, you know, philanthropy. It's so funny. I just realized, by the way, Desiree, that you're on the board of UNICEF and obviously we do so much work with UNICEF, so we should connect on that, by the way. Um, yeah. but yeah, mm. I, I, I think that, that uh, my goal... to check you from stage. Right, right. Um, so I think it's really that, I think the consistent theme in my career has been like, and I didn't know that this was like, I just realized that this is sort of what I do. I love watching women in particular, even though I'm involved in an apartment list too, and it's founded by a man, but ultimately I just love watching women really achieve their goals. And I, I don't know, I think that's just my calling and I, it just evolved. It wasn't something that I was really conscious of doing. I just noticed that I was doing it and I haven't sort of stopped. So whether, like I said, whether it's like watching an entrepreneur, someone like Evelyn, for example, I'm involved in Yumi, I've been working with Yumi for a long time now and really believed in what her and Angela have been doing, or whether it's Parker Dark here at Class Pass, or whether it's helping Whitney expand for Bumble, expand to India, whatever it is. Like, I think I see a woman and I'm just like, yeah, I want to be, I want to help, you know, sort of like power, power what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. No, I love it. That makes great sense. I love it. Evelyn, we wanted to ask you, so this is a huge jump you made from being, you know, a top journalist to breaking out of the industry and jumping sort of to the other side and being a founder. How did that happen for you? Yeah. Um, and in some ways you can kind of see the parallels if you sort of abstract it. Uh, so I was a journalist, as you mentioned, for about a decade, um, working for the times and the journal and, you know, it was an incredible career, I, I really loved shedding light on important stories. And so whether that's business stories, I was also a foreign correspondent out in Southeast Asia, covered, you know, Boxing Day tsunami when it happened. And so it was shining a light on these stories and helping people make sense in, you know, these articles that I would write. And so helping unravel that. And, you know, I think the parallel comes in when I started learning about the importance of the thousand days. And I actually don't have kids yet. My co-founder, Angela, uh, who is also very close to Thanjula and that you know Desiree, of course, uh, she had a child and we've been friends for years that predate the company. And she's sort of this uh, big nerd, big research nerd. I think that's why we get along so well. I was like a professional researcher and she created this Dropbox of all these clinical studies, uh, just like Angela Wood, she went to primary sources. And it was just so stunning to learn about how important the first thousand days are more so than the rest of your life and how specific nutrients really do impact everything from neural development to physical development eventually became the story I, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, and I, I think like, you know, when, when you're also asking Anjula about her career, and even though she technically plays in everything from the world of Priyanka Chopra to the world of startups, I also see this through line in Anjula helps, you know, people tell great stories that have stories to tell and help them unlock these platforms that become these great agents of change. Um, I also think there was these moments throughout my career as a journalist that really helped me see kind of the power of entrepreneurship. So because I was, you know, had this first row seat in covering startups, I remember I was talking to this VC, this guy, Reed Hoffman, who started LinkedIn, but was also VC. And he said this one line that's always stuck with me. He was just randomly in between, like actually the questions I had, it was like, we were on a break and just chatting. He was talking about how he loved Archimedes, who is this Greek mathematician and inventor. And he had this quote, which is essentially like, if you give me a lever and a place to stand, I can move the world. And he was like, that's what I see in startups, right? The idea that like they can be incredible agents for change and that every day all these efforts add up to eventually moving the world. And I think as a journalist, you know, I, I loved covering stories, but I was like, what if I just had one story? What if every day could add up to something big? And so 
it very much was a left turn in many ways as a career, but I, I do think there was these through lines that, you know, connected the two worlds. That's amazing. I love that story. Thanks. Mike, so you are known for saying, do everything with purpose. And I love that. I just think that, you know, it, when you wake up every day, you're coaching others and you're coaching yourself and you're leading the charge for Asian Americans. Like, what, what is it when you say do everything with purpose? What does that mean to you personally? Yeah, well, first things uh, that I recognize just being on this panel with Anjula and Evelyn and, and, and your passionate introductions is, is passion. Like everybody here is, is extremely passionate what they do. And so there's no substitute for that as you're going through your careers or whatnot and your trajectories and your biz perspective businesses. But for me, you know, I, it's funny. I, my director of operations posted that on social media because I was telling the guys, yelling at the guys, play with purpose, play with purpose. And so for instance, in, in the basketball world, if we go out there and play our five guys and we're trying to score on offense, um, they can't just go out there and float around. We have to have a plan, um, an intentional um, plan and try to go execute that plan. And for me, what that means is, you know, and you can apply it to your lives. Like you said, you wake up every day or your respective businesses that you, you need a plan that you can actually evaluate. So you need to go try to execute that plan and see if it works or it doesn't. If it works, great. You know, if it doesn't, now you can make adjustments. And I think a lot of times, you know, I'll take a lot of this stuff to basketball coaching is if the guys are just out there floating around and not actually trying to execute the plan, well, we can't really evaluate. We didn't actually try to go execute what we were trying to do. Um, and, you know, for me, one of my, I guess, pivot moments in my life was, you know, we, I, I was in, actually in real estate when I, when I knew Matt or Matthew, um, Matthew Woods, and, and, and I introduced him to his wife, um, one of my other best friends. Um, and we went through the crisis of 07, 08, 09. And I just happened to be, I, I coached high school basketball for nine, 10 years, just JV high school basketball, but that became a passion of mine. But going through that crisis in 07, 08, 09, I remember I was just flying, flying on a plane kind of lost. You know, what am I doing here? I'm, we're, we're barely surviving. And I just took out a little notebook and just wrote some new goals down. And, and, and I really encourage my, my players and staff to do that all the time. And it just gave me a teeny bit of purpose. And one of the things I wrote down was just write five letters to division one college coaches and just writing those five letters just gave me, gave me some purpose. And I actually got one response eventually. And it obviously led to this, me chasing this crazy dream. But for me, it's just, Doing something, a plan, having an intent, intentional plan, and being able to evaluate that plan in whatever you do. And um, that, that, that's what purpose means to me. That's beautiful. I have goosebumps. I know you guys can't see, but Mike, I love that you wrote the letter, just like sent it out into the universe. It's like just a, a, a mission to say like, you know, can I do this? And I think the belief in yourself when you do that is the first step for many people. And I agree with what you're saying. I, I coach some of the top stars in the world, including Jennifer Lopez. And it's the same thing. She's on set one day and she's like, I wrote down three things and this is what I'm thinking about today. And it starts to come in to be real if you write it down, but it does not become real if you don't write it down. It's just a passing thought, you know? So it's, it's that sort of intention. Evelyn, I wanna go back to you because I love what you said about the first 1000 days. Cause when you think about something like that, like that, intense like that a thousand days you, you don't want to mess up you can't mess up a day then and i think a lot of us sort of live like oh well you know i'll get to that tomorrow you know i'm doing great it's but tomorrow i'll do this tomorrow and we don't think about i got to do it today because this is one of one thousand days i have a chance to change the world so when you're you're raising and you're doing all that you're doing because you have some of the top investors in the country believing in your vision and behind you do you feel, do you set like okay i've got a three month window are there time blocks for you and sorry i didn't prep her on this question i just threw it out at her but i can't resist <laughs> it came from the archimedes that it's like what what do you how do you help coach yourself evelyn do you have like time limits where you're like okay 30 days 60 days not how do you do it yeah i mean and a lot of that especially as it relates to the company i do with my co-founder right so we always make sure that in all the blocking and tackling that we do. And I do believe in the daily lists. Like I once read that like Sheryl Sandberg, it, it was probably in her book, you know, every single day, there's like a physical piece of paper. She writes out the key goals. And then at the end of the day, she rips it out of the, the journal. And I think it's like, you kind of need that to like 
force and connect the the physical as well as the mental and it, it really helps so i'm a huge believer on lists on a daily basis but i think like every single month like angela and i we do like a check-in together like are we thinking about the biggest potential step changes for the company like how are we thinking about it this month how are we thinking about this quarter how are we thinking about it this year and then how do we think about it in five years and is what we're focusing our time on because that is like one of the most like scarce resources is our time as founders is that laddering up to that five year kind of like vision right and so we try to do these regular check-ins together and it really helps like i mean she's like the other side of my brain i was the english major she was the math major but i think to your point it's like you kind of have to push it out in the world and you just have to constantly gut check because it's so easy to follow the rail. And, and this is what's great about also you, Desiree, and Anjula. It's just like having those mentors and advisors to like push you in the right direction. Like, are you thinking big enough? And being an additional gut check is so helpful. I love it. Anjula, I, I want to go to you on that too, because I do think that you're a force for good from the outside for these companies. So when you're advising and you mentioned ClassPass and Bumble and, and bringing ideas to them and you, me, and all these brands, like you're a force for good from the outside. So you're sort of looking at the company and thinking about what could I do? How could I bring my resources to bear today? Like, is there something that inspires you? Do you sit down every week and say like, oh, let me think about my list of brands or does it just pop up or, or, or how do you do that? What's the magic behind it? Yeah, I think it's always in consultation mm -hmm. with, with who you're working with. So for example, you know, when Evelyn, myself and Angela were talking about Yumi, we talked a lot about churn and how to retain people and, and customers. And one of the things that we started talking about and brainstorming was, um, was really around how do we how do we become more than just you know feeding babies how do we become part of their lives and the parents lives and nutrition on a much bigger level so we started talking about actually working really closely with the nutritionist to to track development so i sort of gave them the idea and then angela and evelyn went off and started working with nutritionists and started tracking development like what's developing in a baby at six months what's developing in a baby at nine months and how do we create nutrition that really you know, um, you, it develops with them. So it's really meaningful and purpose, purposeful in the development of a child. And I'm not being super articulate about it, articulate about it, but I feel like when I talk to an entrepreneur or when I talk to Priyanka, we talk about her dreams and her goals. We talk about, you know, whether it's class pass, we just talk about what is it we're trying to achieve. And then I will generally sort of come up with ideas around that and then connections to make that happen. So it's like, okay, well, you should speak to Desiree. Like you want to do X, you should speak to Desiree. You want to build your profile or do this. I'll be like, you know, Desiree's the best at this. So we should speak to Desiree. So it's like sort of like defining the problem, creating the solution, and then finding the people to come around that solution, come around that to create the solution. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing equation. It happens to have the added benefit that you're in the field in New York and LA in a really meaningful way. So you might be having lunch tomorrow with somebody who's going to be super important to Evelyn and the team, and it's just going to come out. And it's, so it's great for them to have you. And I think when you guys think about getting advisors around you, you want to know that they're in great industries, not always your exact industry, but they have, so you sort of tentacles in other industries. And I think, and Julie, you operate like that. So it's great to yeah, hear the I mean, And if I, I can chime in here, I mean, Anjula is also like no bullshit, right? She's not just going to, sometimes you need the cheerleader and she's a cheerleader too, but she's also, you know, the sandpaper Well, she'd be like, no, like you should actually look at it this way too. Like, have you thought of this? Like she helps us, she becomes this forcing function to for focus, right? And I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges I've realized as a founder, like your eyes are so big, like your, the mission is so big, you can get easily distracted. I, I've often heard this phrase, like startups often dive in digestion <laughs> more than anything because they just take on so much. And it's almost that player coach mentality, you know, it's in Mike's world of like, you need someone to be like, here's an interesting play we should run here. How do we think around the corner? How do we make this still ladder up to the big things? But here is where you're going to get so much impact. And having someone that becomes a force function in your life for that, it just, it, it helps a lot. It's very clarifying. 
yeah. You know, Desiree, and, 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 I also want to just to jump in there because you you referenced this earlier about the universe and what is so amazing in my life. It's really amazing in my life. Like I could be having lunch with Evelyn and Angela and then the next day, and we'll talk about a problem and the next day I'll meet the person that solves that problem. And it's just yeah. like, it's serendipity. It's whatever you want to call it. But my life has just evolved like this constantly. I, it's, it's really weird. The universe will always, and I always believe that I will meet the right people at the right time. It's kind of my mantra. Like, that I have in my life, I just know that I will meet the right people at the right time. And I never have anxiety about networking or meeting people, or I need to meet that person or this person. I never have anxiety about it. And I know a lot of people do like, they're like, I've got to go to this and network at this place. And I just don't, I just, I know maybe it's a God thing, but I know that God will bring the right people into my life at the right time. And maybe it's like, the belief of the universe, but that's always happened, like always happened. So there's also some sort of beauty in the universe there. I, I love that. And I think that you guys out there, if you think about trusting that and being more open to it, I, I find that it, same thing happens for me and my clients as well. And there is some scientific studies on it called relationship science. And they talk about how loose ties are very powerful as well. And I think sometimes people feel like, oh, like you said, I don't want to go network. And it's like, okay, you're going out into the field and you are actually making connections, like connections that will be advantageous to you and to your business and to hopefully in some way in the future that's unknown right now. So basically when you go out, there is something more, I, I call it the universe, but if you want to get science based on it, there is a real science to it. Mike, I'm going to call on you again. So when I no. always want to ask, question so you're getting grilled by me personally i always wonder like the coach you know you have bad days you wake up and you're like on the wrong side of the bed or the baby was up all night and you didn't get in sports center last night or something happened and then you got to walk out and coach this team into success and they cannot see what is behind that that you are cranky or this or that you got to walk in and it's showtime how do you muster up that showtime because it, it's, it's imperative yeah yeah, I just had, had I was up all night. He, he wouldn't sleep last night. So, um, you know, I, but just to touch on the universe thing and you're talking about relationships. What's crazy is Matthew Woods and I worked at Comerica Bank 23 years ago, started out of college and we're roomed together. And now 23 years later, I'm on, I'm on this call, um, which is very just like you talked about serendipitous and, and just how, how it all happened. And, and then all of a sudden, I, you know, introducing him to his wife. Um, we, head coaches are not allowed to have bad days, just like you guys aren't. Just, you know, and you said at the very beginning of this call, like you have to bring your A game every day, right? Um, and ev we deal with losses all the time. <laughs> like you either win or you lose. And so that's the whole goal of a, of, of a head coach. And, and my job as a leader is to continue to focus on the process. It's such, I tried, as I said, don't, don't use coach speak in this, in this call today, but it's, it's, it's the truth. You know, you set a standard for your team and the players and your staff and setting that standard and, and really living by that standard. And, and some people call it standard, some people call it values. You know, what are the values that you really believe in your, you want your company or your, your team to live by? And do, for me, it's like, do the players, when they walk into this building and to the gym, do they feel those values? So, you know, one of those values for me is, is, is joy and positivity. So I want them to feel that every single day. Are they in this motivating, encouraging environment every single day. So I hold myself to that standard because coaching is really just setting a standard and then holding these guys accountable to it. And that's the same thing in running a company. There's no difference. It really truly is. And trying to build a company or, or whatnot or managing your clients. And um, you know, that's, that's really, we're not allowed. The first thing everybody told me when I got the job is just so you know, Mike, like you're not allowed to have a bad day as a head coach, but of course I do, you know, of course I do, but it's just focusing on the standard. The standard is that, I, when I recruit these guys, I tell them, we want fountains, not drains. We, we're going to have losses. I'm going to walk into the gym. I don't want to be in a gym. And I tell the parents, I don't want to be in a gym full of guys who aren't light bulbs. Like, so I recruit light bulbs. I want great attitudes and great work ethics because we're going to lose. It's going to happen. And so when I walk in the gym, if I expect that from them, and that's a standard that we hold, then I try to hold myself to that same standard. No different than any of what you guys are doing. And even today on this call. I love it. That, that's exactly that's what wakes me up in the morning and makes me energized when I think about coaching and leading for me it's it's so inspiring thank you for sharing that um 
Anjula, when you think about, I mean, we do want to get a little celebrity, you know, scoop here. <laughs> so when you think about Priyanka in the world and bringing her here, was there, I mean, because you said the other day from Bollywood to Hollywood, and I just love that because, you know, we don't, in America, Bollywood is known and it's, and it's a beautiful industry, but it's not like just, you know, general, it's not the general public is like, oh my God, Bollywood, of course. And so you really open the door and she is everywhere and anywhere you want to be. And she's so iconic in American cultural landscape now, um, Priyanka Chopra Jonas. And it's just, um, <laughs> how, how do you make those decisions? And how, I mean, you're her partner in crime, obviously, as I keep repeating, she name checks you from stage whenever she can. So you have a big, oh. um, role to her to think about herself and the world and you know all these decisions because it's super important how she's presented as a fresh face and, and a diverse face on the, the American landscape so any insight it, it wasn't a particular hardcore question but just any insight into how you do that <laughs> I mean I think it's like you know and that's, uh, I mean I'll tell you the story of like how I first found Priyanka that's that maybe that can lead us into this so I wasn't actually someone that watched Bollywood movies um and I was at my mom and dad's house in England and they watch Bollywood, Bollywood movies all the time and I saw Priyanka on TV at my mom and dad's house and I by the way I was in tech then I wasn't in celebrity or even in music I wasn't in entertainment period I was purely in tech working in Silicon Valley it had nothing to do with the entertainment industry at all and I remember like watching her on TV she was doing this like hip hop dance booth thing on this in this Indian movie and um, I just turned to my mum and I said, oh, who's she? And my mum said, oh, that's Priyanka Chopra. And I was like, what, what does she do? Like, obviously she's an actress. My mum was like, oh yeah, she's the number one actress in India. Like she's massive, blah, blah, blah. I had nothing to do with the industry at all, but I had this little click in my head and it just went, oh, if anyone could make it in America from South Asia, from India, it would be her. And rewind, you know, growing up in England, watching television, seeing South Asian people represented in such a stereotypical way, which is blatantly racist in, in, most, in most cases. I'd always had this dream and desire to, you know, change pop culture because I held it responsible for the way I was bullied at school. I held it responsible for the way I was treated. And um, I was just sick and tired of these like grossly racist stereotypes that were really used in television and pop culture for my people. Even up till like now, I mean, recently with like Apu and the Simpsons and, you know, it's just like, I always wanted to change that. So when I saw Priyanka, I remember thinking she could change that. Like that was what went through my head, but obviously I wasn't in the industry at all. And then fast forward um, with Jimmy Iovine, who had backed my company, he's the founder of Beats by Dre and Interscope Records. And then he backed me with Desi Hits, which was a platform I was building, which was cross-cultural content, content from Bollywood to Hollywood. And um, we'd just done all the music for Slumdog Millionaire, which was like top 10 in 10 countries. And Jimmy sort of gave me a ticket and he was like, is there, what do you really want to do? And I said, I really want to change pop culture in America. And I really want to, you know, sort of change up the narrative for my own people. And there's no one in pop culture that I can look up to that's like from South Asia um, that really resonated with me. And he, you know, he basically gave me a ticket and said, well, what do you want to do? And um, I was like, this is woman, Priyanka Chopra. And the first thing he said was, can she sing? And randomly, again, the universe speaking to me, just like days before I'd been working with Lady Gaga and these two producers in India, and they sent me a demo tape that Priyanka had done, which they had just recorded for fun in their studio with her. And they sent that to me, I sent that to Jimmy, and he was like, oh, she can sing. So we ended up signing her for a record label. And honestly, I remember when I was thinking about it, I didn't really care if it was music or what it was. I just wanted to bring her out here. And then the next job came to convince her to come out here because, you know, she was like number one in India and she was, you know, rocking it. And why would she want to risk this huge career from uh, from India to come to America? There was, you know, so I had to kind of convince her of that and be like, just like, give it a shot, give it a chance. So, you know, I think that I, you know, it was interesting because it was off the heels of taking Lady Gaga to India and watching that whole kind of journey happen and, and, I guess I was just fearless at that moment in time because everybody told me that taking Gaga to India would not work. Everybody was like, she's too risque, she's too controversial. India's like 
this, that, and the other. And I was like, no, if you get the storytelling right, which, you know, is what you do, Desiree, it will work. And it did. And I think I had this bold confidence that everyone was saying, Bollywood will never work in Hollywood. No one's ever made it. So I just had this bold confidence that I'd just done it that way with someone that people considered very controversial. I can definitely do it this way. So I don't know if that answers your question anyway, but like, that's kind of the story of how it went. It's amazing. That's wild. I had never heard the part about you being with your parents in the flat in London. That's amazing. That's a lovely, I knew the other part, obviously, with Jimmy Iovine, but that's amazing. And, and it's amazing that it's um, for you something that's so straight from your heart, from your childhood. And Priyanka is that for so many people now. So you have changed the world and you have changed the way people get to see themselves. So bravo. I mean, bravo to all three of you. This is so incredible. I'm so inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, Evelyn, is there anything on your mind? I mean, I can ask you a question, but is there anything on your mind that you want to share as we're going in the conversation? I know we got to wrap up soon. Yeah. I mean, uh, what's top of mind. I, I think, you know, this is such an incredible group. And I, I think the topic is definitely something that's relevant to all of us. I mean, Desiree, uh, to turn the tables on you, like when you think about crafting stories, when you think about uh, creating and lifting stories that matter, how do you do it? Because I'm mm -hmm. always so amazed by the way you break things down. Like I could, and, and similar in, in, in Jula's superpowers too, it's like, I feel like I could ramble on for an hour and then you're like, oh, well, this is what you're trying to say. <laughs> this is how <laughs> you guys will, will build a story that will resonate with the public. Um, so I'm curious how, how you do it. Yeah, um, I love telling other people's stories. It's my superpower. It's something I can hear somebody's story and sort of dig in and then pull out the relevant. For me, it's like a hero's journey. So I never knew that about mm -hmm. Angela until today thinking that she might have been bullied. I never knew that. I see a beautiful woman on the screen here today that is super acceptable and everybody should think is gorgeous and brilliant. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> we never think Thank of a you. young woman in high school who might have been bullied. So I think the when you think about your story, sometimes you want to help people dig in and be able to put themselves in your shoes. And I think it's a lot of women in particular fail at this because they go straight for the creds like i'm this this and this i went to this school i have this grade point average and i've sold this much and i did that and i'm an evp and I, and it's like okay that doesn't stand out in anybody's brain it's a list of credentials it's like if i read you the ingredients from something it doesn't stand out but if i say that yumi is going to change the game for baby food and put in whole new you know bits of science and love and energy into it, then you're like, oh, wow, ingredients are science and love and energy. That's so interesting. But if I said in the Yumi products, it has whole grains that nobody's going to remember that later. Like that's the famous thing. Like people don't remember the facts. They remember the stories. So I always encourage people to think about their own story in that way and find something in their story that is unique. And for, for many years, for me, I'll give you one personal one for me is that I grew up in a very military family my father's green beret and like used to go running in the neighborhood in his army boots. Now you want to be embarrassed. Your dad is running around the neighborhood. Everybody, other fathers wearing new balance or Nike. My dad would run in army boots because he was like, they're the best for you. Like who wants to run in sneakers when I could run in army boots? <laughs> Is that your dad like running around? I'm like, yeah, that mm -hmm. oh, was my dad. And I was like, it was so horrifying. And I would come home and I would take the boots that were by the door and I would like hide them in the garage and try to move them if my friends were coming into the house. And my dad would be like, where are my boots? I'd be like, uh, I think I'm in the garage because I was hiding them. And I would not talk about it for years. And people would say, and I had to be, and my dad, we all had to be in the military as his children. And I went into ROTC and it was this horrifying thing for me where I hid that fact of my life. And then like 10 years later, I was like, that is amazing. Like, this is part of your journey and it made you who you are. And your dad was a great leader and he taught you a lot about leadership very young. And it was embarrassing at the time, but it was an amazing education in the world and a great skill to have and have somebody think about. So now I talk about it all the time and I'm sharing it here and it's funny, but for years it wasn't funny. So I think when you think about your own story, what are things like, 
the worst part of what you wouldn't want somebody to see or I mean actors do a great job at that too like sharing what is their most uncomfortable moment because then you're rooting for them you're like okay how can I root for this person and I, I think Mike in sports they do such a great job of that they're like you know so-and-so is a major underdog and came from this and, you know, a really hard scrabble story, single mom or no mom living with their grandmother. And then you're like, I got to root for this person to get up to the top. And it's like people, so don't be afraid to tell, to show your defects and tell somebody something that wasn't perfect in your career. So you can say like, you know, I did this and this. I didn't get, you know, I went for this and I didn't get it, but like, thank God I didn't get it because my journey and I'm here with you today. So somehow you turn the outcome into something that's positive. And I think that's also good for your own mental health too, is how are you looking at adversity and seeing how it brought light to the world or to yourself or to your family in some different way. So I think about stories like that when I get into it. Thank you. Pastor. You know, Desiree, I, I just wanted to share a quick story with you on that because, um, so just my first startup failed dismally. I was very like literally locked myself in a closet for I don't know how many days because I was just, you know, so, so stressed about it. I'd lost investors money and I was like, thought I would never come back again. And um, Jimmy Iovine told me, by the way, before he, he was one of the investors and he told me before it failed, it was going to fail. And I said to him, so why are you investing then? He said, because you're, you're an album, not a single. And um, mm. so just the whole thing of failure, like whenever I feel like I failed at something, I'm like, but I'm an album, not a single. So um, I just feel like as people deal with failure, that's a great story. I love that. We can all, Mike, you got to bust that out on your players today. You're an album. <laughs> oh, man. Great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, is there anything particular when you're coaching people that you think about that helps you get it done for them? Like, cause you have to dig and talk about me understanding somebody's story. You got to understand how to motivate somebody to bring their best on the court that day. It's not like you can bring it next year. You're, you're going for motivation that day. You know, first of all, just to, since we're all sharing our, our uh, most vulnerable moments, you know, the funniest thing about my 11 year chase to be a head coach, first of all, I would never dream that I'd be in this position. It just happened because of the universe and, 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 stuff that happened to land in my lap. Um, but I was demoted three years into my coaching career. And that was really um, what changed me. You know, I was three years in, I got promoted sec first year, promoted second year, and three years into my college coaching career, thinking I'd made it, thinking I was, oh, I'm, I'm in. I got demoted. And and, and uh, just, to, just to listen to what you're saying, Angela, it's, it's setbacks aren't what make you weak, which is always, you know, I was, I even have it as my, in my notes here. I'm like, should I tell people I got demoted <laughs> or not? But it's what you do with them. And, and obviously it was, it was, um, it's something I do share with coaches. Now I've gotten a little more comfortable with it uh, because it's, you know, you don't want people to think, Oh, is he not a good enough coach and whatnot? But you know, the, the, the one thing I would say is just that what was, I was the minority of minorities for 11 years and there's not many Asian coaches. There's just not, and, and, and it is what it is. Um, well, what's the funniest thing in the world is that somehow getting to this level and being a head coach, all of a sudden it's, it's, it's a catalyst for my career and for this university being, being this unicorn, all of a sudden, what was a, such a challenge in 11 years of people don't, they don't really hire Asian coaches. They don't really think that we can recruit. They don't know if we can really coach on the floor. They know we can do the analytics and, and whatnot. And people stamp me with that. And I accept that. I tell all the young Asian coaches that call me, hey, I'm, they, they, they think I'm good at analytics. Take it. If somebody, I'm not even really that good at analytics. I believe in it. But if somebody wants to tell you you're smart, <laughs> so I say take it. But I, I think it's, it's just really telling that for 11 years, I didn't even know that I was Asian. I mean, not I knew I was Asian, but I'm saying that they didn't respect me for that. And all of a sudden, I'm a head coach and just sports center and Jim Rome and all this. And now it's this catalyst for, for me being on this call even. For, for, for Matthew calling me and, and, and asking me to be here. So, you know, I, I really believe this. I, I heard this one time, um, like you can't hate on hard work. And I, I, the reason I work so hard is because I'm passionate about what, what I do. So chase your dream. Don't let, anybody, don't let anybody stop you from it because somehow I got to this point and now all of a sudden it's this big, beautiful story, um, which I'll utilize for our program and for our, for our basketball team and university. 
I love it. Can't hate on hard work. That's for sure. Can't hate on hard work. There was a real estate yeah. guy who told me that. One of my competitors, he's, he, he annoyingly told me that, but I, it always stuck with me. And I was like, that's true. You can't hate on hard work. You know, I just have to jump in on that because it's so funny about that Asian thing. So being South Asian, being Indian. So when I lived in England, nobody thought we were smart because the, most of the um, uh, as sort of more working class and, um, you know, they came as immigrants and they were working in shops and they were, you know, doing buses and like whatever. So. I wasn't used to people thinking I was smart because I was Asian. And then I, then like 20 years later, I'm in Silicon Valley and suddenly I'm raising money in all the VCs and they just think I'm smart because I'm, because I'm South Asian. And I, it was just so weird to me. Like I was just like, and then I had this English accent on top of it. So they were like, wow, you sound like an attorney and, and you start and you're, you're Indian. You must be really analytical and like, you know, you must be an engineer. And I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm terrible at math. Like it's the worst thing ever. Um, but it's just so funny how when I realized the psyche of Silicon Valley and I could use this to my advantage, oh, did I use it to my advantage? Like I was happy for people to think I was deeply analytical and would really, you know, get the numbers of it. So it was just so funny. Yeah, it's so crazy how people want to judge when we walk in. And that's why I do think having a good story and being confident and telling your story and taking the time to practice it is so valuable because when you walk in, people don't know what they're dealing with. You know, you can put out a life force and as we said, the intentions in the universe, but if you can get to your story pretty quickly and tell somebody who you are with insight, I think it really is very helpful in breaking down Getting some feedback. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. I just got the, the that we are good. Um, <laughs> thank you guys so much. I think you guys dropped some thank serious you. wisdom on the audience today. It was really amazing. A lot of this I've taken to heart. Thank you so much for sharing. Mike will be watching for you on um, ESPN Sports Center and rooting for you. <laughs> okay. Hi. Amazing. Thank you. Have a great holiday weekend.